It's Windows 10 Death Day, and Microsoft somehow screwed that up. 9070 XTs <laughs> are also melting, and AMD looking to expand beyond x86. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're going to be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Tuesday, October 14th, 2025. Just as a reminder, on Friday, we had our PC giveaways for all of the PCs on twitch.tv forward slash UFD tech and UFD music, and we've got new ones going on now. RTX 5090 PC over on UFD tech and a 5070 Ti PC over on UFD music. But just for anybody who hasn't visited in a while, we actually have implemented a few new systems into how we run these giveaways, including over on UFD Music, we have a referral program. So if you head over there, twitch.tv forward slash UFD Music, type exclamation point terms, you should be able to find out all of the new ways that we're uh, trying to operate these giveaways. You can find out more details there. And in case you're trying to find out the details, can I get off of Windows 10 now that October 14th is here of 2025? And this is the ending date of that operating system that a lot of people loved and they want to move on to Windows 11. Turns out Microsoft completely borked the media creation tool that would allow you to do that. Yes, the very program that allows you to upgrade to Windows 11 does not work right now. This is apparently a bug that's been there since September 29th, but is becoming more known because people are trying to get off of Windows 10 and it turns out that you cannot use it for upgrading right now. It's not working as expected on Windows 10 to get onto Windows 11. So you're struggling a little bit in that regard, but there is a way around this. You have to download the ISO and create a image flash for yourself in case you don't know how to do that. It's pretty simple to Google, but it does show that Microsoft is not necessarily fully thought out in this whole upgrade cycle to Windows 11. Millions of PCs are gonna be left in the dust when it comes to lack of support because they are fully capable computers that are not able to end up on Windows 11 officially. I just think it's a little tee hee ha ha that that's happening, but don't worry, even if Microsoft's letting you down, you know who's not gonna? Today's video sponsor. What does my voice and a PC fan have in common? A filter. Get it? Because I sound funny right now. While my voice isn't being filtered by today's sponsor, Silverstone, your PC still can be. The FF-127 is the latest model of Silverstone's famed fan filter series, and it is possibly the best one yet. It combines all the most desirable features from previous filters into one product and then some. To start, it's got a beautifully finished high-strength aluminum frame with integrated magnets that you can use to place it anywhere on your case of steel panel vent openings without the use of a screw. The mesh is made of stainless steel with woven mesh that is formed with wave-like ripples to let air flow through better than flat filter surfaces. It doesn't sacrifice any ability to catch fine dust particles either. Rated at up to 200 degrees Celsius or 394 Fahrenheit operating temperature, it's designed for the toughest computing environment. So that means it'll reliably filter for the life of your PC. Keep your PC fans flowing and free of dust by picking up some Silverstone FF-127 fan filters today via the link below. Thanks to Silverstone for sponsoring. Well, while getting a Silverstone fan filter just makes sense for your computer, what's not making a ton of sense is Apple's latest rebranding move. I'm just talking about this because it's silly. We're supposed to get new Apple products later this week. M5 products for the iPad, the MacBook, as well as the Vision Pro are supposed to be launching, but they also launched a rebrand of their streaming service, which used to be known as Apple TV Plus, but now is going to be simply known as Apple TV. And you might be wondering, don't they already have something called Apple TV? The answer is they have multiple things already called Apple TV. The device is called Apple TV. The app where you access both Apple TV stuff and Apple TV plus streaming stuff is called Apple TV. And now the streaming service itself is called Apple TV. So even in their own press release, they say Apple TV is available on the new Apple TV app. And for a limited time, customers who purchase and activate a new iPhone, iPad, Apple TV or Mac can enjoy three months of Apple TV for free. So they mean the service, but it sounds like they're gonna rent you a device. You get a little box for three months and then you have to give it back. Who knows? Doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's Apple, so what can you do? But what also didn't make a ton of sense previously was Google's entry into the smartwatch world. I'm not saying that the Pixel watches weren't good or anything. I'm saying that they sucked to repair, and in fact, Google would not repair them. If you brought in a broken screen for the Pixel 3, they would just throw it out. They would just give you a brand new one. They were replacement only when it came to the cracked screen on the Pixel Watch 3, but 
Pixel Watch 4 has a few things changing in that lineup with iFixit calling it the most easily to repair smartwatch on the market right now. The Pixel Watch 4 just being simply taken apart, but then also there's service repair guides from Google. iFixit doesn't quite have repair parts yet, but that should be options that's gonna happen moving forward, especially since there are walk-in repair options that you can do for this. Whereas previously, Google would just say, hey, here's a new one leave us alone we're gonna we're gonna move on which i'm gonna do to reese and so he can give you the deals yo welcome back to ufd deals bringing the hottest tech deals out on the internet and hey here's your first deal of the day starting off with the hyperx cloud 3 wireless gaming headset for only 74 dollars 99 cents making it 75 dollars off but the next up we have the corsair nautilus 360 rs aio cpu liquid cooler for 89.99 making it 20 dollars off and hey no rgb and then lastly we have a great entryway into am5 with the md ryzen 5 7600x going for 149.99 making it $150 off. And hey, with that, the deals are done. You can find these and more linked in the video description down below. But until next time, man, your fact to this guy for the rest of your hot news. Cheers. Well, Reese, turns out that even if you go on to AMD and not NVIDIA with the 16 pin power connector, you're getting a bad deal because a new user has reported a burnt out 12 volt dash two by six connector on their Sapphire Nitro Plus 9070 XT GPU. This is not the first time we've seen this happen on an AMD card. It's previously happened on ASRock GPUs, but it does continue to show that there's just something wonky about this power connector. You can see from the picture of this Redditor that the blue power connector is definitely melted. If you look at the 16 pin power connector on the backside of the Nitro Plus, it does kind of look like there is some nylon melted there, but it could also just be artifacting of the flash making it look like it's that way. But 970 XT, not looking like it's having a great time with that power connector. I think you know, maybe maybe another iteration, 12 volt dash three by six, and then, uh, you know, eventually uh, we'll move back to eight pin, hopefully at some point. But we're also moving back to single slot cards. Galax announcing the 5060 Ti 16 gigabyte single slot card. I'm all talking about this because I like the way it looks. Reminds me of the 1070 Katana that they released way back when. Obviously, they're looking for this to be more of a professional card, but I think gamers could absolutely use this. AI would use less GPU core, so the heat wouldn't necessarily be as big of a problem in the single slot configuration, and then you could install multiple of these in a given system, but uh, single slot 5060 Ti hitting at least the Chinese market for right now. Hopefully, it'll, uh, you know, Galax will pop up in other regions. What's also popping up is NVIDIA's little AI workstation box, the DGX Spark. This thing that was supposed to launch way back in the first half of this year, then got delayed till July, and then got indefinitely delayed. Finally, launched launched yesterday on a public holiday here in the United States. Launched worldwide, thankfully, but the DGX Spark is this little mini PC that they expect you to use for AI purposes that's about as compact footprint as you can get with one petaflop of FP4 AI performance, only 240 watts power draw and weighs 1.2 kgs. They compare it to their DGX1, which was their big honking like server cluster that you had to get all the way back in 2016. Cost $130,000, weighed 60 kgs, drew 3,200 watts, had 128 gigabytes of GPU memory, whereas the DGX Spark has 128 gigabytes of unified system memory, kind of like their version of Strix Halo, but having more NVIDIA acceleration for that and costing a whopping $4,000. Also, I just wanna highlight Dell's version of this because Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, a whole bunch of companies are releasing their own version. Dell's calling theirs the Pro Max. Goodness. And I don't know what AMD is gonna call this next project, except for the code name that we have, which is Soundwave. This is AMD's new entry into the ARM chip market. It looks like AMD is gonna venture outside of their x86, x64 agreement that they have with Intel and are shipping manifests showing that Soundwave is making its way at least to specific people. So this is an APU, an all-in-one system that has both the CPU and the GPU all put together, and it's called Soundwave comes in a BGA 1074 package and it's just popping up. That's all we really know about it at this current moment. There were reports in previous months that AMD was gearing up to potentially do some sort of ARM architecture launch. And now it looks like we're getting stages closer to that with shipping manifests being a pretty important part. It looks like it's a validation version of this product. We'll have to see when, if, how this comes to market in the future, but NVIDIA's was using ARM. They're gonna be using Intel moving forward. Intel, not really using ARM, but uh, times, they are a changing. AMD looking to compete in various different aspects. They already have Strix Halo, which is a beefy 
APU that kind of goes toe to toe with things that Apple's putting out in their M4 Max and Pro chips. And then if they come out with something that's ARM related, they might be able to move that market forward. We'll have to see. And I want to see what you guys said in last week's episode of Hot News in the comments. Well, before we get into that, I do want to just give a shout out to Kyler who released this review on the Ion Neo Flip 1S DS. We posted this yesterday. Shout out to him for getting that done, especially as this transition to South Africa has been happening. So go give that video a watch in case you haven't. Go appreciate the hosting styles of Kyler because they are a different vibe for sure, but I enjoy them. And just to highlight a comment from that, as F says, finally, Portable Nintendo DS. Great top comment. And then in Friday's episode of Hot News, we got P. Grief saying, I have no idea how fiber speeds in the US compares to South Africa, but here in the UK, granted I live on the outskirts of town, my max internet speed is significantly lower than what I could get in South Africa, and my internet and RSA hit close to the advertised speed most of the time. I can honestly say my broadband and cellular experience in South Africa was way better than here in the UK. There might be other problems in South Africa, but internet is not one of them. You know, I've kind of lived through those stages when I moved here initially in 2015, I'd started this channel on ADSL and a Telcom LTE router. That was the best I could get at the apartment complex my family and I were living in. And so, uh, you know, I was here for when the internet was way worse than the States. And then I think about a year into me living in that complex, they finally got fiber ran with OpenServe. And then from that point forward, so like 2016, 2017, I've had immaculate internet here in South Africa, barring when power outages happen and I can't access it. But also uh, power in the States, it's kind of variable with uh, the office in Pittsburgh, fantastic. Gigabit up, gigabit down, uh, worked as advertised. I had Verizon Fios, I believe. I had absolutely no issues. Anytime I would call in to customer service to like fix things that were wrong, they like believed me when I was like, I already reset the ONT, can we move on to the next step? So like their customer service was really helpful uh, in that regard. But when I lived in Florida and I had Cox Communications and that's based on cable, a coax cable, not on fiber, that was atrocious. My fastest speed down was 300. My fastest speed up was 35. It was not great and they charged a heck a lot for it too. And they also charged me for data usage. I got a, I think it was a terabyte free a month. And then I had to pay for unlimited data on top of that. So it was worse than I, what I have here. And I was glad to finally leave that situation once we, we moved to Pittsburgh. And then we got the Linux gamers journey saying, regarding the comment from the previous UFD tech about Expedition 33 versus Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, thought I'd chime in as well. I didn't enjoy turn-based games until your excitement convinced me to try Expedition 33. And boy, was my mind blown. My goatee? Definitely. Perhaps even greatest game I've ever played. That's, I, Expedition 33 just hits different. I know it's a turn-based game, but the Sandfall Interactive devs cooked up something magical, and it is absolutely my game of the year, and I would also agree, probably the greatest game I've ever played. Story, immaculate. Sound design, immaculate. Character development, fantastic. Gameplay, awesome. The, 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 I, just come, I just loved every aspect of it. The 10 out of 10 in every area. And a person, Joe Niney, saying, thank you, Brett, for moving that can forward. You cured my anxiety. And then TH Seed, great name, saying, feels weirdly comforting that Reese handing us back to Brett is an in-person exchange now. Um, I've seen some comments, like yours is positive, thank you for that. I've seen some other comments talking about how uh, it's weird that like we're in the same place, but we don't film hot news together again. I film these at like 6, 7 a.m. my uh, in South Africa time, just because it's the best time for me to get it done. And Reese isn't in the office at that point. So uh, that's why there's a little separation there. I, I work earlier than they do and that's, that's okay. So that's why you get hot news separated from Reese and then deals with me and him together. And we got Monkey saying, I wonder what Brett thinks about the new Vita C sub brand of the one's faux cough. I know what you were trying to get me to say. I'm not going to say. Uh, also, Super C and Score has a competing products for Vita C, which is also nice. Haven't tried them yet. Uh, mostly just been trying the, the new flavors like Banoffee, the blueberry meringue, speckled eggs. I, we had another one recently. Yesterday, I bought a whole bunch. Can't remember what they were. Haven't tried the Vita C yet. I've tried the Biogen ones, but not the Vita Cs. And then the mic saying, is VR gaming dead? I feel like it's dead. You feel like it's dead? It's it's not dead. It's just kind of always been a gimmick and it hasn't really evolved past that besides some like arcade games like Beat Saber. Beat Saber is just an arcade game. The only evolution it has seen is going from gimmick to Gorilla Tag. And Gorilla Tag is a massive game, massive industry, making tons of money, but that is like such a limited subsect of why people would like play VR games. The industry stagnant is what I, 
is what I would say. I wouldn't say it's dead. Hardware is really good right now, but the experience still hasn't developed much uh, since like 2015, 2016, when you could get the Oculus uh, deep, uh, dev kits in the, the HTC Vive initially released. And then Nico saying, is Switch Energy Drink sponsoring the drink in the video there? Or does Brett need all that energy to make it through the day? <laughs> Neither. Switch is not sponsoring. Uh, not that I would be opposed to that. Switch, you want to hit us up? We're absolutely looking to work with you. Get a Switch brand fridge in the office because I have to buy so much because uh, we keep it stocked here. A, a, a UFD tech flavor. I've got ideas. You hit me up. And then also, uh, forget what I was going to say. I don't need all this energy. But, like this is this is an old can. I like I drink maybe one a day, maybe uh, sometimes two, uh, but we we do have it available in the office for, for wh whoever wants it. And it's a shout out to South Africans who are watching the videos without me having to acknowledge that I'm here in the country because I physically have something that is like brand recognizable and also like a, a South African uh, exclusive drink. So like, it's just a, hey, look at this. And then we're gonna talk about the overtime thing that I talked about on Friday's episode of Hot News. We got Next Nate saying, fun fact, salary workers are not exempt from overtime. Hey, fun fact, Nick Snake, it's regional dependent, just, just so we're clear. But fun fact, my salaried employees are exempt from overtime. So uh, if we just look at the Pennsylvania labor laws, who qualifies for overtime payments? Hourly employees, absolutely. Most salaried employees and earn less than the federal salary threshold are eligible for overtime. My employees earn more than that threshold. And most salary employees who do not perform executive, administrative, or professional duties are eligible for overtime regardless of how much they are paid. My salaried employees perform administrative duties. Some of them perform executive duties. Kyler is the manager of the UF office. He has the ability to hire and fire without my discretion. So like he, Kyler is an effective managerial position that exempts him from that. So they are exempt from overtime uh, because of Pennsylvania state laws. And then also uh, it, I can require them to work overtime and there's no limit. That's like, those are the laws in, in Pennsylvania. Fun fact, maybe it's different for you, but for the UFD tech office in, in the States, we don't really work overtime, but that doesn't mean I can't. <laughs> I have power that I'm choosing not to wield because I like these guys and I want them to have a life which I'm gonna go do. So I'll see you back here for more of the Hostech News later.